we can come back for further questions. Do you want to expand or Okay. Um, for the first question, it's like how can we, um, uh, what would a settler critique of indigenous capitalism look like? Is that kind of what you're talking yeah, about? How, how do we... um, well, I would, like I tend to look at these questions a little bit more historically rather than from a normative perspective. And one of them is like the critiques of indigenous peoples from the like settler or non-indigenous left have tended to be organized around around questions of labor versus questions of land dispossession. So I try and articulate in my own work and kind of thinking um, a, a kind of framework that looks at them as co-foundational. Um, you can't do like they they operate together and you can't have one without the other. So even in the 1970s, some of the responses to Dene from the left were like, people are exploitable, land isn't. Like, we, they just didn't understand that sort of relational um, sort of aspect of our kind of, our forms of production, and articulations of identity, and how central land was to that. So we'd, you'd have to kind of, like my one thing would be like, well, you, we have to understand um, how these violences are affecting different people in different ways, but produce the system that we're now kind of working under. So, so it's always kind of a pushback, like Fanon and Sartre were doing, to the kind of white left um, that were justifying what was going on in Algeria, that are justifying what's going on in the tar sand. Like, it depends, but like, we just have to, we have to kind of understand that. Uh, we can't just focus our critiques on a critique of capitalism via um, its exploitative enabling effects. It has to understand uh, that relational sort of land-based aspect to it. And at least then we can have a conversation together on how to, how to think strategically about this sort of stuff. As for the politics of recognition thing, I think it's a pretty firm indictment of recognition as such, but like, like as a political theorist, I'm also I understand that 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 recognition is just not something you can say uh, um, yes or no to. We're all constituted as subjects by the relationships that we have with others, how others see us, how we experience those social relationships of place. So it's not like oh, I can I'm going to get out of this ontological aspect of my identity by saying no to it. But this, like these appeals to um, these hegemonic institutions of state and capital, or or what have you, um, in order to make some sort of demand on it to uh, curtail its genocidal behaviors toward us, I just say we have to really kind of um, interrogate w with a lot of skepticism, um, partially because it's a drain on our on our resources, like our. It, it, like we've put a lot of our eggs in one basket over the last 40 years, especially within kind of those struggling within the kind of paradigm of Aboriginal rights and, and constitutional change, which has sapped organizing from actual, um, actual mobilizing in our communities. So, so it's not, I'm not like um, puritanical in the sense that I'm like, like I'm not going to finger wag at people who are appealing to uh, the state in order to stop it from coming in and and cutting down trees or doing whatever, um, or especially because this, like I've tried to uh, stress, the violences of this are experienced by our communities or our members of our communities in radically different ways. So if we're appealing to the state on a question of policing, for instance, or an oppression of like law and order, in order to kind of make some sort of immediate intervention into violence in our communities against uh, queer and, and women folks, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kind of, oh, the politics of recognition demonstrates that in the long run that's just gonna reinforce this, uh, this patriarchal land state over our lands and bodies and nobody wins. Like, we have to think of it both in the what is, what are the immediate needs of our communities in the context of a longer term um, kind of more radical strategy. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I can't add anything more to that. I agree with that completely. Uh, let me talk about some of the other things, which is uh, there were two questions that led to, that, well, 
about whether success breeds failure. There's a minimum wage, a minimum guaranteed income might buy off people if I understood the question. Can you raise the voice or you said yeah. a minimum guaranteed income might buy off people because that success would make them sort of willing to tolerate things. Uh, one could say the same thing about guaranteed health care, about which I know nothing because I come to the U.S., but <laughs> you can imagine. Uh, movements for self-determination uh, as a kind of accommodation. I, I think the, the only answer that makes sense to me is that you can't, you can't say that it's better for people to be worse off so that they see what's around them. I just don't believe that. And I don't see that the people who believe that are themselves proposing to be worse off. They're proposing <laughs> other people to be worse off. And for a practical reason alone, being worse off doesn't incline you towards the left. It inclines you towards the right. So you should pay attention to that. And that's what I meant about talking about white working class people. Uh, um, so yes, it does buy off some pressure. But on the other hand, it also gets the sense that you can do something and that just because you've succeeded partially in something, uh, part of our job is not to give up just because of that success, but to keep pushing for some other things that come up. And there are plenty of other things. We have a long list, all of us, for that. So what would be so bad about guaranteed minimum income? Guaranteed health care seems like a pretty damn good idea to me. And I see that unemployment insurance is a pretty good idea. Anybody who's been unemployed can appreciate that. And um, uh, transfer payments of various sorts are good. Yes, there are limits. Capital will not tolerate it beyond certain limits. We also know that. But our job is to, to push the limit, to push it to the limit, and be prepared knowing that for the reaction. I mean, I think one of the mistakes that we make in our enthusiasm on the left is to think that capitalism is very plastic. That's one mistake. And the other is that it's not plastic at all. And in fact, it is quite adaptive. And it can accommodate something, but it can accommodate everything. So then it can move around to something else or another location. We really have to pay attention to the history of that. Uh, I would argue that one of the things that's happening in Europe now is the rolling back, the attempt to roll back the gains that the working class made in Europe over a century. And certainly the welfare state is an example of that gain. And uh, Germans, uh, finance ministers, and bankers, and people speak openly about the fact that they, we need to get a system that is more like England and the US, uh, more flexible, as they say, with labor. And what they mean is very clear. If labor is cheaper, if productivity is higher, if workers are easier to fire, then you have more of an incentive to stay using <laughs> capital in there rather than taking it abroad. And so from their point of view, it's logical. Uh, and there's a truth to that. That doesn't mean you should then say that we should move back to the 1930s. You have to accept that that is their truth and fight against it in one form or another. Um, robotization. Yes, uh, from the old uh, argument in Marx, if the uh, ratio of uh, dead to living labor rises, and robotization, by the way, doesn't automatically imply that, but it does sort of suggest it, uh, then the rate of profit falls because one element of the rate of profit, which is the denominator of it, is rising. And other things being equal, that brings that down. Uh, I showed, I measured this number in, in my book over the post-war period, and it is pretty steady. It uh, essentially uh, increases at about 1.5 percent. Uh, it varies between 1 percent and 1.7 percent uh, over the post-war period. Why is that? Because it occurs at the micro level. Because new methods diffuse slowly. As they're adopted, they're modified, you get people in to take care of them. And so even though you can see some fluctuations in, in this number, it is actually pretty stable. So how long would it take for capitalism to approach what Rosa Luxemburg once called a heat death, which is when it runs out of profitability? And I think that, that's a question I don't have an answer to, but it's pretty long, I can say that. And the reason I think it's long that brings down the profit rate, other things being equal. But the rate of surplus value can be expanded. 
as we know, in every advanced country has been expanded by attacking labor and reducing the welfare state and reducing real wages can be expanded also to move into other countries of the world. Just as we're talking about the problem in the center, capitalism is busy creating a capitalism where labor is cheap. Uh, already I hear people from the uh, business community saying that uh, China is such a yesterday's thing because their wages are beginning to rise and if you look at it, they're beginning to lose their advantage in certain key industries of manufacturing. Those are going to uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand and other countries who are even worse and working conditions are even worse. So uh, from the point of view of the center, these are all bad things, bad signs. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid that the problem isn't robotization. It's the move towards cheaper labor, which low profitability or, or profitability differentials and wage differentials bring about. If capitalists could do it, they'd bring in all the labor in the world right here. It's cheaper. I mean, they've already got the transport uh, infrastructure here, but they know it's politically not possible. So the other option is to go there. And they have been doing that. Uh, I think robotization is going to dramatically transform how we do things, whether we like it or not, including academia, by the way. It is much cheaper to have one professor at Harvard with 10,000 robots, TAs, than to have uh, badly paid 5,000 professors all over the world. And they're clearly, Coursera and all those things are clearly just setting up that possibility. That's the point, is that to uh, robotize even academia. So it's not somebody else's future, it's our future. Um, uh, so I think that's it for me. Can I ask one question? Yeah, you can ask a question. Um, <laughs> When you were uh, skeptical to kind of offer any like, sort of uh, anything too predictive in terms of what the outcome is of this is, I was wondering if like one of the outcomes seems to me, unless you can or I want you, or maybe you could speak to this, is that we live in an ecologically kind of finite world. So one for sure thing seems to be, and there's now kind of a generating consensus on this is that we're just going to like kill ourselves. We're going to destroy the. We're going to destroy the con like the living context in which, um, or this system will destroy the context in which it can sustain life. I was wondering, does your work have any sort of um, ecological in insights that are perhaps a little bit more hopeful? Than <laughs> well, uh, I tried to say in a sort of elliptical way that I think capitalism is very inventive. Uh, and I think it has uh, capabilities, if the pressure is great enough, to moderate that effect on the environment. But to be honest, it, it, the effect is only relevant if people fight against it. I mean, China is an exact example of how you can pollute to the point where people can't even breathe, but you're making profit, and that's the key point. You're making profit. And that's what motivates the system. So it's a question of whether we have the power to impose restrictions. But I don't think it's going to involve the death of capitalism, but it's certainly going to increase the cost of capitalism. And that has other possible implications, including its growth. And we've done this historically. The history of environmental regulation, of workers' regulation, of, of uh, safety regulations, ex exactly imposing costs on capitalism. And it survived. It's actually pretty healthy, uh, given all of that. There is room. That room is not infinite. So I don't see the immediate uh, uh, environmental death of capitalism. Uh, I, I, I grew up on a Superman comic, if you remember. And Superman comes to Earth because his father and mother understand that the uh, planet Krypton is going to blow up and they can't persuade anyone else. Everyone thinks they're crazy, so they put their kid in this capsule and shoot him to Earth. Uh, I think capitalism actually is not like that. I think it's quite capable of dealing with the environment. It will slow it down, but I don't think there is uh, heat death coming. And I could be wrong. I mean, uh, there are plenty of stupid people in capitalism. That's not a problem. <laughs> but I think that the pressure on it is getting bigger to the point where the, even the people in power realize that they're not going to escape it. And they have the means to stop it. And they have the means to turn it around, I think. OK, I'll throw it back out now to folks in the audience. <laughs>